to share with you, those who are online and those who are in person, and especially our new believers, on the topic, no turning back. No turning back. Let us pray. Father in heaven, let your Holy Spirit take charge now and bless your people and glorify your name as we listen to your words. We pray in Jesus' name. You can go with me in your Bibles to this second epistle of Peter. It was read earlier so well for the scripture reading. I will be spending some time there uh, as we seek a word from the Lord. Let me read the first, first four verses. It says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus Christ our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. Usually it's a practice in the epistles, if you notice in the epistles of the New Testament, the author would address, would identify who they are addressing the letter to. For example, the church in Corinth, or to the church in Rome, or to the church in Galatia. But in this case, the Apostle Peter is not addressing a ge specific geography necessarily. Peter says, he is speaking to people who have obtained like precious faith. Are we together? So those are the people that Peter is addressing. I want you to know that Peter is not addressing unbelievers. Are we together? Peter is addressing people who have obtained like precious faith. There are two ways that we can interpret Peter's statement about like precious faith. Number one, it could mean that Peter is saying that when you sometimes when we look at apostles and prophets and we feel that God gave them a special endowment of faith more than others, Peter is saying, no, the same faith that has given me the power to be an apostle is the same faith that you have received. Why are we together? The same faith that led Abraham to be a faithful and to be called the father of the faithful, it is the same faith that you have received. And you have not received any less privileges than Abraham and the patriarchs. As a matter of fact, the Apostle Paul tried to make that point in the book of Hebrews when he presented a list of faithful starting from Abel and Enoch. And Paul is saying, you have a cloud of witnesses to show what you can become in Christ. The second possible interpretation is that Peter is saying that you Gentiles have received the same faith as us Jews, but um, the same principle apply. He's saying he's speaking to people Secondly, in, in the same passage, Peter referred to those people as those who have escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss. Those are the people that he is speaking to. Are we clear on that? We are clear who Peter is talking to. And for someone who have read the entire book of 2 Peter, and I've examined it several times. I'm going to tell you in one sentence the essential message that Peter is telling those who have come to the faith. Do you want to hear what Peter is saying to them? 
Peter is saying to them, you who have come to the faith, he's saying to them, stay on board. Are we together? <laughs> That's what Peter is saying. Stay on board. And he's telling them how they can stay on board. And I want you to understand, my brothers and sisters, that this message is coming from someone very special. Peter has been assigned this responsibility by the Lord himself. In St. John chapter 21, and you can turn in your Bible there with me, St. John chapter 21, reading from verse 15, as soon as Jesus was resurrected, and reunited with the disciples. One of the main responsibilities that Jesus carried out was that he restored the apostle Peter to the fellowship. He restored his confidence. He said to Peter, Simon, Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And Simon said, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said, Feed my lambs. And he asked Simon the question again, Lovest thou me more than these? And he says, Yea, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, Feed my sheep. And he said unto him the third time, Do you love me, Simon Peter? And Simon was upset because he asked him a third time. And he said, Lord, you know that I love you. You saw me, Lord, that night. You saw me in my distress. You saw me in my disobedience. And you know that I have repented sincerely of my sins. And Jesus said to Simon, feed my sheep. You see, my brothers and sisters, this message is coming from someone who almost fell overboard. This message is coming from someone who knows what it means to almost let go. Simon knew and can remember the words of Jesus in Luke 22. In Luke chapter 22 and verse 31, when Jesus came to him and said, Simon, Simon, the devil wants to sift you. The devil wants to sever you from me. But Simon, I stayed up all night in prayer for you. Simon, I have prayed for you. I, I didn't pray that you would not stumble. I pray that after you have stumbled and come to your senses, that you would not let go. And Simon, here's a task. You know, I tell you, God's love is amazing. Because Simon got this commission even when Jesus knew he was going to deny him. Jesus says to Simon, Simon, when you are converted, strengthen the brethren. God is amazing. It's amazing that God did not choose angels to do this work. God did not choose angels who never fell. God chose Simon Peter who knows what it means. To, f to be self-confident, making a mess of his life, come to his senses, and know that he's standing on firm ground, he can help others. So the question is, do you want to hear what Simon Peter has to say? And I wanted to know that Simon Peter in this passage of scripture gives a two-step process towards being an overcoming Christian or towards being an overcomer. The first step is what we read earlier in the first four verses. The first step 
is that we must escape the corruption that is in the world through loss. That's the first step. The question is, have you escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss? Based upon this passage, there are two, there are two nature, contending natures that the apostle present. Number one is the divine nature, and number two, the flesh or the corruption that is in the world through loss. The apostle John speaks about this corruption. In 1 John chapter 2, in 1 John chapter 2, if you turn with me quickly, reading from verse 15, John described what this corruption is. He says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, I wish somebody would hear this. All that is in the world, the loss of the flesh, the loss of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the loss thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. John is saying that the world is corrupt because the world is made of, of people who are operating with a different nature than the divine nature. They are operating on principles of rebellion. And let me give you one more Bible text. I won't carry it too wide. One more Bible text. I'm taking it slowly. In Romans chapter 8, because I want us to understand clearly what this corruption that the apostle is speaking about. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 5. The Bible says, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. And then he goes on to describe what the flesh is. He says, for to be carnally minded is what? Death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That's what corruption means. The corruption of the world puts us in a position that we are at enmity with God. Why? For it is not subject to the law of God and neither indeed can be. And so the Bible says, those who are in this position cannot please God. That's why the Apostle John says, all that is in the world, loss of the flesh, loss of the eye and the pride of life and they produce works that Paul in Galatians chapter 5 19 21 describe as the works of the flesh they come from a heart that is not in harmony with God's will Peter is saying my brother and sisters that any good works quote unquote that you do without escaping the corruption of the world only makes you a moralist. You're not a Christian. You are a moralist and not a Christian. If you have not escaped the corruption that is in the world, if you have not been washed, <laughs> if you have not been converted, if you have not been born again, because this nature cannot be modified. Are we together? Because Romans chapter 8 says that it is, not only is it not subject to the love of God, but neither indeed can be. So if you're going to follow Jesus, Jesus says, if any man will come after me, he must die. Self must die. He must deny himself. You must have experienced a death, burial, and resurrection. That's the only way you can escape the corruption in the world. By experiencing the new birth that Jesus says, if any man will enter the kingdom, he must 
be born again. Not of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but is born of God. What do you say? That's stage number one. <laughs> but it doesn't stop there. But you must get there to move on. <laughs> Peter is saying, if you are here, you are the one I'm talking to. If you have escaped the corruption, if you have been born again, I am talking to you. Your next step is that which is found in verses 5 through to 8. He says, and decide this. <laughs> are we together? I am not the one doing the addition. You know. Peter is doing it. He says, besides this, besides what I have just described to you, besides being born again, besides escaping the corruption in the world, here is your duty. Giving all diligence add to your faith. What do you say? You have obtained like precious faith, but that's only the start. You need to add to your faith. Your best bet at ensuring that you do not lose your position, that you do not revert to what the corruption of the world is, is that you must add to your faith. You must grow in Christ. What do you say? You must multiply. You must grow into maturity. You have lots of spiritual acquisition to do. Here's the list that Peter says. He says, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, to patience, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. So my new believers, my brothers and sisters in Christ, we have work to do. What do you say? Matter of fact, matter of fact, Peter is saying, this is how you make your calling and election sure. <laughs> You make your calling and election sure by growing up in Christ. So you cannot stop here. You have escaped the corruption of the world. You cannot stop here. No turning back. Before I, before I get to the promise, that Pe the, the promise that Peter gave, I want to explain a little bit about these virtues. Paul, Peter says he must add to your faith virtue. Virtue represents excellence of character and, and, and sums up the total package of what you must add. And to that you must add knowledge. What knowledge I'm talking about? It is a knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What do you say? It is that knowledge that Jesus says that this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. So as a new believer in Christ, you must grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. What do you say? Grow in your relationship with him. Get to know him more day after day, and you can only do that by spending time in his word. But if, if it's knowledge alone, then probably the Pharisees would have been perfect. But Jesus says, add to knowledge self-control. Self-control, you know, one, one of my students asked me the question, what is self-control? And I, Pastor Grant, I thought about it long and hard to try to make it as simple and clear as possible so that um, you can understand. Self-control is making the right choices. <laughs> the reason I define it that way is because God is the one who enables you to make the right choices. What do you say? But it is up to you with all of the knowledge that you have. If you, if you read the Bible from cover to cover and you don't practice to make the right choices, 
Proverbs is um, chapter 25 there about I don't that I'm not gonna quote the exact reference but I can quote the scripture it says he that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that is broken down and without walls what the Solomon is saying is that if you don't have self-control anything can come in and anything can go out because a, a wall a city's wall is what protects it and guards it from, from all external lines. So you need self-control. Pray to God for self-control. Then you, to self-control, you must add patience. Are we together? Some translation call it endurance. So sometimes you'll be placed in situation that require of you patience. Are we together? And, 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 and that's why the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 5 says, We glory not only in this, but we glory also in tribulation, because tribulation produces patience. And, and they are connected, by the way. And then G. White says that an intemperate man cannot be a patient man. You cannot have patience without self-control. It is self-control that is a precursor to patience. And so it's like a ladder, it's a connecting link. And then to, to patience, you must add godliness. Godliness has to do with reverence for God. Worship, devotion to God. You must have devotion to God. And then to that, you must add brotherly kindness. Because guess what? If all you do is worship God and don't love your brother, John says your, your religion is in vain. Are we together? <laughs> and then to brotherly kindness, the capstone of character development for you is charity. And time won't allow me to describe charity based upon what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. But here's a promise. Get with me to verse 8 now. Here's a promise that the Apostle Peter the one who almost fell off the boat. <laughs> Here is what the Apostle Peter is promising you, my new believers. He's saying in verse 8, If these things be in you and abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. And skip to verse 10. Verse 10 is connected to it. Wherefore the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. So to make your calling and election sure is to add to your faith these virtues. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. Let me quickly explain what never fall means. It doesn't mean you, you will never stumble. It doesn't mean you will never, like Peter, make mistakes and blunders. What it means is what Jesus said to Peter when he said, I pray that your faith will not fail. In other words, when you make a mess of your life, you will not give up. But you will get up back and press forward because no turning back is the mantra. So he's not saying you will never fall, you never make mistakes. Because Peter himself knew what it means to fall. But what Jesus prayed for Peter about is that when you fail, because let me tell you something, what, what happens when you make mistakes? The devil is going to come to you, Pastor Grant, and say, listen, man, God, nobody, nobody will it again, man. God, here you, God, here you confess too much time. I'm not going to listen to you again. Let me tell you something upon the authority of God's word. If you hear that voice, it is not the voice of God. It is the voice of the devil. Because he is the accuser of the brethren. And his purpose is to make us look so bad. That we will never try again. But let me tell you something. When Jesus told the disciples. When the disciples asked Jesus. How oft shall my brother offend me and I forgive him. Till seven, till seven times seven or till seven times. 
and Jesus says to 70 times 7 most times we take that word to mean that Jesus is being difficult but my brother and sisters what Jesus is saying is not only that we should forgive each other 70 times 7 but that God is willing to forgive us more than 70 times 7 so no one turning back no one turning back if you do these things if you make it your life work to add to your faith and to grow in Christ despite your mistake Peter says you will never fall away you will never apostatize because anything that is not growing is either dead or is dying but the message is not finished you know I, I could finish the message here because you have gotten the point are we together I could finish here because you got the point the two step escape the corruption and grow in grace but unfortunately Peter could not finish you know why he could not finish in chapter 2 the reason he could not finish the message there it is because there are false teachers in the church there are false teachers who will not only by their teaching but that their lifestyle will make you feel that there is an alternative lifestyle are we together? Who will make you feel that it is okay to live like the world and still remain a Christian? I don't have the time to go into it. But here's what the Apostle Peter says in verse 9. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and had forgotten that he escaped <laughs> he had forgotten that he escaped the corruption he had forgotten that he was purged from his old sins you see there are two types of Christians you'll find in the, even within the church today those who possess the qualities mentioned or adding them and those who lack them these are represent two conditions in the church in, in, um, in the world you see let me tell you something based upon this the study of this passage Peter is saying there are two conditions in the world the one represent those who are in the corruption are we together and who have not been converted not surrendered to Christ but there is another who have escaped the corruption but become useless are we together let me quickly jump to 2nd Peter 2 so then I'm not gonna read the entire chapter I want to get to the point 2nd Peter 2 and verse 19 here's what Peter is warning us against it says while they promised them liberty they themselves are servants of corruption <laughs> for of whom a man is overcome of the same is he brought in bondage for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world they have escaped so the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter end is worse with them than the beginning for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness and after they have known it to turn from a holy commandment delivered unto them but it is happened unto them according to the true proverb the dog is returned to his vomit again and the soul that is washed to her wallowing in the mirror Peter is not talking about here the struggling Christian he's not talking about the one who is striving and, and thinking he's talking about people who are living in the corruption but they claim to be Christians and then anyway I talk about them in Acts of the Apostles I won't have time to read it but I want to close with the final point 
the dangerous thing about being in this condition is when we convince ourselves that God is okay with it. <laughs> are we together? We are living in the corruption that we escaped and think that God is okay with it to the point where Peter had to point and say, listen, if God kicked out the angels who sinned, if God kicked out the angels who sinned, that's verse 4 of chapter 2, he's not going to spare you either. And if God did not spare the people in Noah's days, he's not going to spare you either. And if God did not spare the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, he's not going to spare you either. You're no special. None of us are more special. If you're living in corruption, God is going to destroy you. And some of these same people were challenging the apostles' authority and were questioning his source. And therefore, as I wrap this up, Peter says to them, listen, what I have told you is no cunning that defies fable. I did not make this up. <laughs> I was, I am an eyewitness to his glory. I saw him in the mountain. I heard a voice say that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He is the one I am following and I'm telling you if you're following too, you will make it as well. And not only am I an eyewitness, but we have a more sure word of prophecy. The prophets also testified that this is the one. What do you say? And if you follow him, you cannot go wrong. So the apostle is saying, do not return to the mess. <laughs> no turning back. What do you say? No turning back. Do not return to the mess. There are some who have returned to the mess and are making a mess of the gospel. They are making a mess of the church. They are making a mess of the, of the reputation of God's church. But Peter says, listen, as long as I am in this tabernacle, as long as I'm alive, I am going to remind you of these things because this is your duty. Your duty is, number one, to escape the corruption which God has given you by his power. And number two, to grow in grace. Make sure that you're growing. Make sure that you're adding self-control. You're adding virtue. You're adding knowledge. Make sure you're adding patience, brotherly kindness. And you're growing in love into maturity. Because if you do these things, you will never apostatize. You will never fall. You will continue to grow in grace. Amen? Amen. God bless you. The song that I would like to sing to close this message is number 625. I'm pressing on the upward way. New heights I'm gaining every day. Still praying as I onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground.
in prayer. I want to make two quick appeal here today. You're here today and you have not yet escaped the corruption of the world. You have not yet surrendered your heart to Jesus. Not yet baptized. Not yet surrendered to him. The Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart. And you want us to pray for you that God will help you to make a decision before it is too late. If that's your desire, just raise your hand where you are. We want to pray for you. God bless you, my sister. Is there one more you want us to pray for you that God will help you to escape the corruption. God bless my sister. Is there one more? We're going to pray for you. Is there one more? The Holy Spirit has spoken to your heart today. And you want to make a full surrender. Let me tell you something. God can't mold and fashion you unless you surrender. What do you say? Somebody sent me a text this morning with a message that says... I'm going to find it and make sure I read it to you because it was so powerful. It says, no retreat, just surrender. Surrender to Jesus and he'll begin that work in you and, and, and he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Is there one more person who want to join that, those persons who want to say, yes, pray for me that God will help me to surrender before it is too late. And the second appeal is for those of us who have been walking with the Lord. New believers and older believers. Are we together? All of us I'm appealing to today. If you want to pray like the songwriter says, I'm pressing on the upward way. If you want to pray like the sermon title says, no turning back. If that's your desire, just raise your hand. Raise your hand. Praise God. Praise God. Those who are watching online as well, if you want to respond in that way, just say no turning back. Just type in the chat, no turning back. I will pray for you. Pastor Grant, can you can you find a man?